Oh, that's a great question. There is some truth to that. Plants have thousands of constituents within them. There's a lot of nuance within it in terms of like when we are making an extraction, whether it's in water or oil or alcohol or vinegar, we are choosing based on that solvent, what we're extracting, we're now choosing a range of constituents that solvent is gonna extract. We know the principle of water and oil don't mix, right? So if we're making an, an oil infusion of comfrey, that's gonna draw different constituents. This is not a good example because most people shouldn't ingest comfrey, but that's going to draw different constituents than if we're making a water-based infusion of comfrey. Both work and are still medicinal and therapeutic, but because the solvent is extracting different compounds, those extractants are gonna have different functions and different therapeutic benefits. When it comes to temperature, it's similar. We're gonna do temperature with water. With water, we can extract vitamin C out of plants like rosehip, hibiscus, but we can also make an oil infusion out of rosehip or hibiscus, but that's not going to extract the vitamin C because vitamin C is water soluble. Now, sticking with vitamin C, vitamin C degrades at a higher temperature. You can use boiling water for hibiscus or rose hips, knowing at first point of contact, the first thing where that solvent is doing is softening and rehydrating, and then it begins to extract. So initially, if it's still above, I think it's 140 degrees, that vitamin C begins to degrade. So some of that initial vitamin C, while it's being extracted, if it's above 140 degrees, we're not getting it, but the plant's still softening and the cell walls are still opening with time. When we're under 140 degrees, now we're getting some of that vitamin C. And I can use another example. There's another constituent group called polysaccharides. So we use the word mucilage. And so we know mucilage from slippery elm. We know mucilage from marshmallow root. We probably most know mucilage from okra. People either love it or hate it. So that constituent group that's in okra, that degrades at higher temperatures and it degrades in alcohol. If you want the sliminess, then a more appropriate infusion, although we'd still get it because we get we get it in like soups and stews and you make an okra gumbo, you're going to get some of that sliminess because of also this element of time, which we just talked about. But the best would be a cold water infusion because the higher the temperature, the more it breaks up that constituent group That's and the sliminess gets broken down. You don't get the sliminess. If the sliminess is what you want, it really depends on what our intention is with the plant and what we want from it. For the most part, if you want the slippery, that's the constituent group that people are talking about. You don't want a hot water infusion you want a cold water infusion. And then if you want more of the minerals, you can do one of two things. You can have it sit overnight, just time will extract more of the minerals, or you can add a little bit of acid. So you can add a splash of uh, citrus or apple cider vinegar, and that will help extract some of the minerals too. So what's your intention with that plant? On our website, there is a family infusions ebook, 25 recipes, lots of different plants within it too, but 25 recipes, it's free. Just giving you ideas of how to establish this as a practice for your family. I've made all of them. Just get in and play in the kitchen. That's really what has helped enhancing flavor profiles, knowing what the family likes, what the family's not gonna tolerate. Here are some other herbs that you can choose. Nettle, I like choosing tonic and nutritive herbs that can be taken. Generally safe for everyone, really great for beginners. Generally safe for daily use. So nettle is an excellent base. I'll try to add some nuggets to nettle. For some people, that makes them more gassy. So that happened to me. I drank nettle all the time pre-pregnancy. After, I was like, whoa, I, I don't agree with me anymore. And so if I'm gonna drink nettle, I need to add a little bit going back to those carminative herbs. So ginger um, would be probably one of my favorites. You can add a little chamomile. So if you notice that nettle makes you feel bloated, 
add a spice. All of our spices have some digestive benefit. Add a spice and that'll mitigate that sensation. Oat straw, again, same plant. We know oatmeal, different plant. Oatmeal, milky oats, nervous system, trochal restorative. Oat straw, the grass, the straw of the plant, super nutritive. Mild tasting, rich in calcium, magnesium, and silica. Great for, for everyone across the spectrum of like ages, conditions. The only, maybe a little nugget, sometimes there's cross-contamination, like when we're purchasing it. And maybe people who have celiac disease might be sensitive. So one way that, especially if you're introducing herbs to children or just like a new one for you, and maybe like you have a highly reactive immune system, one way before you start drinking cups at a time will be to make a small infusion, you know, make a cup and then do a skin patch test. So put a compress, do a skin patch test, wait 24 hours, see if you have a reaction or if your child has a reaction. And then I would actually do it again. Do another skin patch test the next day because sometimes people discover immune reactions, not the first time, but the second exposure. So do it again, you can use the same infusion, put it back in the refrigerator. Next day, put the compress on again, let it dry, see if you have a reaction. No reaction, then you can start to take it in small amounts internally and work your way up to that like half a gallon infusion where the half a gallon, those overnight infusions, we, we're using more per cup of water too. So a typical infusion might have one teaspoon to one tablespoon of herb. Your half a gallon infusion is gonna have more. So you can work your way up to that quantity. Red clover is really great, it's nutritive. Red clover also supports hormone health. It has some phytoestrogens in it, so they loosely bind to our estrogen receptors. That is a note if you have a hormonal condition, red clover might not be a friend, like an estrogen receptor sensitive condition. That is one contraindication or to use under the guidance of a practitioner. For family infusions, it's helpful for our developing children, but I wouldn't like make it a single red clover infusion. You can incorporate it into a rotation of herbs and some of them you can blend together using lesser amounts, moringa, now moringa is gonna be green, just like nettle, but it's amazing. Moringa is anti-inflammatory. It has, again, like nettle, like oat straw. It has so many different uh, minerals, trace minerals and vitamins, really supportive for our energy. One trick of the trade is that for infusions that you wanna improve the taste, you can add your citruses. You can add fruit. You can add hibiscus, it's so tart. It really brightens almost every infusion. I almost always at this point add a little bit of hibiscus to all of our family infusions, or it might be an elderberry. Like I add some kind of tartness to it because that tends to make it a little bit more palatable. Niles is now of the age where he's like, I'm not drinking this, this is nasty. So <laughs> without adding sugar, I have to find ways to make it more palatable. Tulsi will make it more palatable as well. It's in the mint family. It's not minty like peppermint, although you can add the mints as well. That'll be really delicious. It just has this nice sweetness too. I can't really describe it. A really nice blend would be nettle, hibiscus, and Tulsi. You can play with those combinations. And then some other nutritive bases are alfalfa, helpful for iron. So is moringa, so is nettle. Red raspberry leaf, if we want uterine toning. You can think about how to time your different infusions. If you know that your cycle is coming on, then make red raspberry a part of that week's family infusion. Just because it's supportive to cycles, like it's supportive to everyone too. It has that nutritive content to it. Dandelion leaf, now we're adding some additional kidney support. Dandelion is more bitter. But we're not afraid of our bitters here, are we? Bitters are super, 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 super beneficial. All of those bitter compounds. We have bitter receptors, of course, in our taste, but we have them all throughout our digestive system. But we also have bitter receptors in our lungs. Bitters help with our rest-digest response. So bitters help parasympathetic nervous system state that 
calm state. And then bitters also really help our digestive system. So when we have bitters and we taste those, then our bodies start to secrete the enzymes that we need. So the saliva, the gastric juices, all of these enzymes and secretions that we need that help us digest food better. Bitters are really, really supportive to that. And it was interesting, I was doing some research, that bitter taste has been engineered out of a lot of our food. Think about all of the digestive issues that people have in these modern times and how much not having bitter plants is contributing to that. In addition to a whole lot of other factors like the high sugar and all the other things that our food system does. But that was one really interesting element that we've been conditioned away from bitters and we really need them. And then lemongrass is another one, adds a really nice base for all these. So these can be mixed and matched and just in different ways, thinking about what your needs are. Sometimes it's nice to just go into your home pantry or your home apothecary and if you have these six, seven herbs, decide intuitively like, ooh, what is gonna be most supportive to me or to the family this week and make it based on that. And then you can add smaller amounts of herbs like elderberry, ginger, peppermint, chamomile, talk about gotu koli, another adaptogen, really mild tasting, kind of savory, just interesting kind of taste. It helps with circulation, it helps with our connective tissue health as well. Reishi is a mushroom that can be added to soups and stews and broths as well. Um, you can add small amounts of reishi. All of our medicinal mushrooms to different degrees have immunomodulating effects. So they help dial down inflammation. Some of them, many of them are also have anti-cancer effects. Mushrooms are, are really, really helpful. And so, which is why you're seeing those trends now as well with all of the mushroom coffees and the mushroom powders. But you can add reishi to your infusion, 